Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Next on Main Street, Wyoming. Humans and pronghorn have been interacting with each other on this exact spot on the landscape for at least 8,000 years. The archaeological work that was done has helped generate interest and public support, and so that's helped bring this project to fruition. This is one of the major contributions of the National Historic Preservation Act in Wyoming. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you. Well, hi, I'm Nicole Wagaspak, an archeologist working here in Wyoming. And we're here today to talk about the Trappers Point site and the National Historic Preservation Act. In 1966, uh, we signed into law, or Lyndon Johnson signed into law, the NHPA, National Historic Preservation Act, which is a way for us to preserve those spots on the landscape, those areas, those distinctive features that make our country unique. So as you're driving down Highway 191, you may simply think, there you are on another uh, Wyoming highway and there happens to be an overpass that looks a little bit distinct. You may not even notice it if you're driving fast, but you're actually driving past a spot on the landscape where for thousands of years, humans specifically went to intercept antelope. This is a place where you are going specifically to hunt, to gather a lot of meat that you could use throughout the rest of the season, but you're driving past a spot on the highway where humans and pronghorn have been interacting literally for thousands and thousands of years. And without the National Historic Preservation Act, that wouldn't be there. We are standing on the overlook at Trappers Point, just west of Pinedale. Behind me is a small hill uh, that was designated as an archeological site in 1986. At that point in time, I was uh, working with the Office of the Wyoming State Archaeologist and the then Wyoming Highway Department was contemplating building a new alignment of US 191 between Pinedale and Daniel Junction and they asked us to come out and take a preliminary look at that new alignment. This area had always been known as a very rich archaeological area but we didn't realize what we were getting into at first because we immediately started finding a wide variety of artifacts, different kinds of features related to uh, stone boiling and cooking and whatnot, clear on all these high surfaces all along the river. When we finished our initial walk, and we started trying to make a little bit of sense out of what we were finding. Uh, we then started trying to organize this information into what we would refer to as an archeological site. We knew from the outset, based upon surface artifacts, that we had everything from around eight or 9,000 years up to the present day out here. Uh, we also knew that this area was very different than the rest of the archeological remains that had been found. What is happening geologically with that little hill is that it is an old terrace remnant. The Green River used to be up high and has left a bank of river cobbles on the west side. When the prevailing winds come from the west, they hit that bank of cobbles and it serves as a, basically a snow fence. And sediment then is dropped on the lee or the east side of that little hilltop. So we initiated a test excavation program to simply find out what was there. And what we immediately started finding of hundreds of, of chipping debris, flaking debris, butchered antelope or pronghorn bone, 
fire cracked rock, uh, many different types of tools such as knives, projectile points, scrapers. And we went, okay, this is not what you normally find every day because uh, believe me, after close to 40 years of doing this, I've done a whole, dug a whole lot of sterile holes in the ground. So we knew we were onto something. So we're here in an archeological lab here at the University of Wyoming campus. And what's sitting in front of me are some examples of the types of materials we found in the Trappers Point site. First, I have a, a small assemblage here of antelope remains. These are not the bones from the actual, actual excavation. Those are a little too delicate to be handling. But you, what you see here is what uh, your typical pronghorn carcass would look like. We can tell from the dentition of the animals we found in this site approximately the time of year in which the kill took place. Looking at the teeth of those antelope remains, we're pretty certain that the hunters at the Trappers Point site took down those animals probably during the spring. Throughout excavation, there were numerous uh, carcasses of pronghorn uh, remains found. It looked like a jumble of the bones you see here in front of you. Mixed in with those faunal remains was an artifact assemblage, and we see some of the artifacts here. In compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act, we were evaluating what might be adversely impacted by the proposed construction. This site turns out to be the oldest antelope kill processing area that's known in the state of Wyoming. As the sediments were preserved uh, on the lee side of the hill, we found three different cultural layers, the oldest of which was about 7,200 years ago, the second one was about 5,500 years ago, and the top one was about 4,300 years ago, filled with butchered antelope bone. What we were able to determine as well is that antelope, which we saw plenty of while we were out here excavating, used this ridge as part of a migration corridor. One of the unique things about Trapper's Point is that it occurs in the middle of a migration bottleneck. And what's interesting about this bottleneck is that it's naturally occurring. It's essentially a one mile wide by one mile long sagebrush ridge that connects the winter ranges of thousands of ungulates in the Green River Basin with their summer ranges uh, in the northern part of the Green River Basin and the mountains of Northwest uh, Wyoming. For those of us who live here in Wyoming, or for many of you who may simply be driving through, seeing pronghorn on the side of the highway is an everyday occurrence. We're used to it. We associate pronghorn with Wyoming. But it's rare that we really have the perspective to look at pronghorn across a huge landscape and to understand their movements, both contemporary on a seasonal basis and through prehistory. It's clear from excavations at the Trappers Point site that I assume people living 6,000 years ago here in Wyoming thought seeing pronghorn was pretty pedestrian as well. But they had this much larger landscape view of where those pronghorn were going on a seasonal basis, could predict where they might be on the landscape, uh, and really capitalize on that. We know they were at that particular site to intercept those pronghorn as they were migrating and would take advantage of that aggregation of pronghorn. So some of what we learned from excavating these sites in a sense, sure, we knew pronghorn were out here in Wyoming, uh, and we've recently documented those migration routes, but it really gives us an insight into how people of the past understood this landscape and their relationship with the pronghorn. One of the unusual aspects of this spot is that this ridge that we're standing on is actually the drainage divide between the Green River here and the New Fork River and Duck Creek over here. And it narrows down right where we are and it forms a bottleneck that where the animals are concentrated as they're on their migration routes. This happens to be on the route of one of the longest uh, large mammal migration routes in North America with antelope, uh, pronghorn, excuse me, wintering in the upper Green River Basin with critical winter range, working their way up here in the spring all the way into Jackson Hole, spending the summer in Jackson Hole, and then working their way back down in the fall. And uh, we were able to demonstrate the antiquity of that route and I think starting to get a very multidisciplinary approach in terms of 
broad-term landscape use, long-term landscape use, and really uh, adding to the knowledge both of pronghorn behavior and human behavior in the process. So mixed in with a lot of these faunal remains of pronghorn were a number of stone tools. Most prominently probably are a number of these projectile points. These would have been hafted to the end of spears that were probably delivered with atlatls. So these are the actual weapons that took down these pronghorn uh, at the site. I'm going to demonstrate the use of the spear thrower or the atlatl as we know it. This simple stick combined with a dart has been used to hunt every animal that ran on the earth, flew in the air, or swam in the ocean. It has been used to hunt mammoth. It has been used to hunt human beings. All throughout uh, prehistory, at one point or another, in nearly every culture in the world, this was the weapon that dropped the animal in their track and allowed people to hunt more safely. And it's the same sort of weapon that was used at Trapper's Point uh, to kill pronghorn. The spear thrower is a very simple construction throughout the world. It's simply a, a stick and the length varies, uh, the width varies, the material varies according to who is ever constructing it and what their needs are. It consists of a stick with a spur. Now this spur, this little point, this tip can either be applied or it can actually be hollowed into the wood itself or other materials. The way this works is there's a long dart, a flexible material, and there's a hole in the end here that the, the spur will fit into. And they are hooked up like so. So when the dart flies, it's actually pushed by the atlatl. And uh, it's this push that gives its, its uh, velocity and uh, direction. For about uh, more than 10,000 years, people used this as their means of hunting and thereby survival in this country. And same with our ancestors in Europe and uh, Asia. <clears throat> and despite its simple appearance, it's a very sophisticated uh, instrument and in the right hands is capable of uh, uh, being very deadly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. People could have sat up on the ridge, maybe up here, maybe down a little bit lower, simply waited for small groups of animals to come by, uh, dispatch them with uh, maybe a throwing stick or in, you know, in later times a bow and arrow, and then brought them to the top of the hill butchered and processed them uh, for future use. The middle layer, the one that was about 5,500 years old, was the best preserved layer. And in the small area that we excavated, we found the remains of something like 27 different antelope, along with a normal campsite and domestic debris from the processing, large hars that may have been used for stone boiling or whatnot to help strip meat. So it's procurement of food for future use. Mixed in with those projectile points that were prim primarily used as weapons to kill those animals were a variety of cutting and scraping tools that would have been used to butcher the prey that they took down. To butcher and process so many pronghorn carcasses probably took hours, if not days. This would have been a major source of food for these populations. They would have spent quite a bit of time butchering and preparing the meat from these pronghorn animals to be consumed there at the site and probably later through their travels as well. From a contemporary wildlife management perspective, the archeological work that's been done at Trappers Point is really fascinating because it has shown us that these animals have been migrating through this bottleneck for five, six, or 7,000 years. And that's really interesting because these migration routes are culturally transmitted. That is, they're learned from mother to offspring and passed on from generation to generation. So the fact that this migration could go on through millennia is really interesting. And the second piece that we've learned from the archeological work is that not only have, has this route been used for thousands of years, but by looking at the 
development of the fetal bones at the site. The archaeologists could tell us when those kills occurred during the course of the year. So based on the development of those fetal remains, uh, those kills were occurring in late March or early April, and that corresponds directly with when pronghorn migrate through there today. It was really one of the most spectacular sites, certainly, that I've worked on in Wyoming from the standpoint of a very rich artifactual assemblage. The other thing that we were able to, to key into was the raw materials and the places where people were coming from to come here to Trapper's Point. Materials being imported in from the Tetons, from Jackson Hole and Idaho, Schertz and other quartzites coming in from the Southern Green River Basin. In other words, this was a congregation area in the spring of the year. Once we started publishing on this and making it known, the game and fish became very interested in this. This had been as a known antelope migration corridor for quite some time. Some people had thought it had just been in use since you know historic times with modern hunting patterns. And that's, this site here demonstrated that this uh, corridor has actually been in use for thousands upon thousands of years and that the people who have lived here long before we did had very sophisticated knowledge of the landscape. For me, this was very much of a game changer in terms of how I started looking at the archeological record, what we can learn from it, how we can start approaching landscape use. It was also very much a game changer with respect to how we decide what's important and having a large enough sample of sites to look at in a, good, a large enough area to be able to make wise decisions about if something's going to be destroyed, what do we need to, to recover in terms of information versus what we can not, not focus on so much or actually let be destroyed. Trapper's Point is used by thousands of pronghorn and mule deer. Uh, the pronghorn that migrate through there migrate anywhere from 20 to 100 miles. Uh, the furthest of those pronghorn make it all the way to Grand Teton National Park. Uh, so this is part of the path of the pronghorn uh, migration route that uh, has received a lot of attention and is actually one of the first federally protected migration routes, at least on the national forest. Based on years of radio telemetry studies, it's become clear how important Trapper's Point is for thousands of migratory pronghorn and mule deer. And because that area is bisected by US Highway 191, wildlife vehicle collisions uh, began to increase as traffic volumes increased, which became a problem for both mule deer and pronghorn uh, in the area. It was a killing field out here with the loss of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of vehicles, trucks, passenger cars, some loss of life, human life, as well as loss of, of pronghorn. And we tried several different things in terms of warning systems to get people to slow down, uh, to be aware that there were animals on the road, particularly during the, during, uh, the migration periods. Uh, none of which worked pretty well. We weren't seeing any particular success. And uh, we even had geophones installed along the edge of the road that would activate sensors with flashers to say animals on the road. And what we discovered was that animals might set them off, but then they might go back up the hill instead of crossing the road like they were supposed to. And so you would get a false positive signal. And so people would think that, well, you know, hey, the signal's flashing, but I saw no animals, so why should I bother to, to slow down? And so to mitigate that issue in 2012, the Wyoming Department of Transportation took on a really progressive and cutting edge wildlife crossing structure program where they installed two wildlife overpasses and six wildlife underpasses in a 12 mile stretch of that highway that encompassed uh, Trapper's Point. With a great deal of input, with a lot of data about where we were getting our most collisions, where the most dangerous spots were. Of course, this particular area with the world's neatest archeological site on it was selected for an overpass as one of the primary migration routes. And we were faced with the issue of preserving that site on that knoll top versus building the bridge. And the initial plans for these called for an earthen structure. 
uh, with slopes coming way out and that it would have been much closer to that hill slope. And we had some very serious discussions saying that if we start touching that slope of that hill, we're going to be getting into all the intact deposits. Again, pursuant to the National Historic Preservation Act, YDOT would have had an obligation to have mitigated those impacts. Uh, to a very valuable site and something that's certainly valuable for preservation right where it is. Bless the bridge engineers' hearts. They uh, actually got in a wall design which very much limited disturbance based upon our old test excavations and also additional ones that we did 20 some odd years later. We were able to determine that that particular location had very minimal archaeological deposits because it had been very eroded and blown and there was not the same type of cultural remains as on that hilltop. Um, designed the bridge so that animals cannot see over the top of it as they're walking across it. A truly multidisciplinary project along this wildlife corridor that it starts off with the overpass where we have essentially recreated the hill slope that antelope would have been using to cross before the highway was down cut into that ridge. The other critical element in all of this are you see the wildlife fencing that goes into all of that and also funneling animals to the underpasses for really close to 15 miles along this stretch of 191. We monitored those wildlife structures, those crossing structures for three years after construction and we found that those structures were used uh, nearly 85,000 times, uh, 60,000 mule deer crossings, uh, 25,000 pronghorn crossings. And what was interesting there was the species specific differences. Uh, mule deer tend to move underneath the highway, but pronghorn, not surprisingly, really preferred the overpasses and more than 90% of those uh, 25,000 pronghorn crossings uh, were on the overpasses. The construction of overpasses and underpasses in and around Trappers Point has effectively reduced wildlife vehicle collisions by more than 80%. So it's been a win-win, a win for wildlife and also has improved uh, highway safety for motorists. But it's also proven a galvanizing point for the people of Pinedale and increasing, I think, interest in the prehistory of the region, as well as the pronghorn migration route we had here. Shortly after we excavated that site, within a few years after the reconstruction on, on 191 was done, the oil and gas boom happened up here. With vastly increased traffic volumes through a migration corridor that extended from here all the way to north of uh, Daniel for both deer and pronghorn. I think the success of the wildlife crossing structures at Trappers Point has served as a, as a model for not only Wyoming but other parts of the West in areas that have issues with wildlife vehicle collisions. So Colorado is now building some wildlife overpasses, Nevada is as well, and certainly there's a lot more interest in Wyoming to do similar work, especially along the I-80 corridor. National Historic Preservation Act has preserved everything from the Welcome to Las Vegas sign to the French Quarter in New Orleans. Part of the National Historic Preservation Act involves any new construction or any work on federal lands. We need to make sure that we're not going to be destroying anything of cultural, of historic, or of prehistoric significance. It's called Section 106. And literally thousands of archeological sites have been discovered through 106 work. Trapper's Point was first identified because of highway construction. At the site itself, we not only learned something unique about the past, we found an amazing archeological site that tells us something about how folks here in Wyoming six, 8,000 years ago plan their subsistence activities, how they utilize their landscapes, but in a sense, we also rediscovered something in a sense we already knew. It took contemporary biologists, zoologists, and ecologists an enormous amount of work to recognize and document that there was a pronghorn migration corridor running right through this area. When we excavated the site, it became very clear that the occupants of Wyoming 6,000, 8,000, maybe even 10,000 years ago already knew that. They knew exactly where to put themselves on the landscape to intercept those pronghorn. 
So sometimes what we learn through section 106 is new material about the past, and sometimes we rediscover something humanity already knew and that we can appreciate in a new way. When we think about what the National Historic Preservation Act has done for us as a nation, as a community, as a state, it really forces us to think about what about the past is most important to us. What are those anchors of the past that we want to make sure we introduce future generations to? That we don't want to lose the unique cultural significance of particular landscapes. That even though we'll change highways and roads will go different directions and oil and gas development will take place in different uh, areas of the landscape, that we really have these historic and prehistoric anchors that we can always sort of tie ourselves to those particular places on the landscape. With any sort of multi-million dollar wildlife crossing structure project, it takes a lot of collaboration, a lot of different people at the table, uh, and the archeological work that was done has helped generate interest and public support uh, that's been important in that whole process because People, not only locally, but nationally, really value this wildlife migration. And so that's helped um, uh, bring this project to fruition. I don't have any dollar figures on how much this is saving in terms of lives and uh, property, but it is considerable. It was a, a really neat, neat project in that here we have the archeological data that we know is going on being used to address a modern transportation problem and a modern safety issue that we were able to bring the public, bring many different agencies and bring all our different expertise into the area and to, to solving the problem and at the same time preserving the archaeological site and helping restore some natural landscape movements. So in that respect, this is one of the major contributions of the National Historic Preservation Act in Wyoming, and it demonstrates how the past and the future can work together. For many people who will be driving down this highway, you'll just think it's another highway, and there happens to be some kind of funky overpass going on top of it. What that really indicates is that humans and pronghorn have been interacting with each other on this exact spot on the landscape for at least 8,000 years and perhaps even longer. And hopefully we will continue to be interacting between humans and pronghorn on this landscape for many, many thousands of years to come. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you.